All right, we're back. It's another Carolina podcast, and it is full-blown recruiting season. We are just a couple of weeks away from the late signing period, and South Carolina got a Spurs up from the class of 2021. So a great opportunity to delve a little bit more into the class of 2021. Of course, you know, very early look ahead, but it's been such an eventful offseason for South Carolina. A lot of moves being made both on the recruiting trail and obviously in their staff, which we've detailed at length over the last couple of weeks. And hey, probably worth noting, South Carolina did not have any staff changes this week for the first time since the football season actually ended. So we are going to be focusing pretty much exclusively today on the 2020 and 2021 classes for South Carolina. I want to remind you real quick before we delve into rate, review, subscribe to this and everything else on the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. Colin Taylor and I are rolling. Got a lot of momentum right now in the hard foul. We'd like to think... Uh, that the momentum we're gaining is being mirrored by the basketball team. Colin and I have agreed that instead of Frank Martin playing, I mean, not playing, giving pump-up speeches and stuff before games, he just plays back the hard foul podcast that we record every Tuesday and Thursday on the Gamecock Central Podcast Network, and that is what has propelled South Carolina to turn their act around in SEC play. So if you want to be kept up to date on everything going on with South Carolina basketball, subscribe to the Gamecock Central Podcast Network, check out the hard foul, and of course read all of Colin's great stuff on GamecockCentral.com. Wes and Chris here with me as always, and guys, we'll start with the Spurs up the South Carolina got late Tuesday afternoon, early evening from Atlanta Westlake's DeMarco Williams. He's listed as an athlete, 5'11", about 185, I'm guessing recruited as a defensive back. Seems like Travis Robinson was his uh, primary recruiter. What can you guys tell me about what Carolina got with three-star DeMarco Williams? Yeah, early uh, pickup for them there, 2021 class. Um, you know, I was struggling... Because he is the first, he's the loan commitment right now to the 2021 class, which would make you think he's the first. But when we were writing it, technically he's not the first because they had Lavasia Carroll committed, but now decommitted. So I don't know if DeMarco, if we get to say he's the first anymore or not. But um, he is the loan commitment right now for 2021. Um, you know, don't, this one kind of came a bit out of nowhere. Um, you know, this is a guy, uh, if you talk to him, you know, recently, didn't really sound like someone who was ready to commit, didn't really sound like somebody that was focused on committing soon. And then uh, he visits South Carolina this weekend. I know Chris caught up to him, caught up with him after that visit and, um, you know, had a good time. Obviously, that's a, a program that I understand has some some pretty good talent coming out the next couple of years. Uh, they've got another guy, Ja'Kai Leftwich, a big offensive tackle that South Carolina is recruiting that was also on campus uh, with DeMarco Williams this past weekend. Um, you know, th- this is sort of, uh, he's, he's listed as an athlete. He's that sort of 5'10", 5'11", mold, athletic kids, got pretty good film. Um, you know, w- w- anytime you have these guys, it's just going to be about how do they develop, um, you know, uh, how they develop their final year in high school, how does he develop when he gets to South Carolina. Um, you know, he's a, a three-star guy right now. That's probably about right, but... Um, it, it does get South Carolina rolling for 2021, which when you look, uh, you know, let's let's be honest, the class of 2021 in the Palmetto State is, is not very strong. So South Carolina is not going to be able to build their class around a big, you know, in-state crop. They're going to have to go to Georgia. They're going to have to go to North Carolina, um, Florida, Alabama, Tennessee as well, I think. So uh, getting them on the board, getting a kid with some upside, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what he turns out to be. Uh, is that his film right there you're watching, Chris? It is. Checking his film out right now. You know, plays receiver, um, plays safety. Um, you know, just looking at him, it looks like he could probably play, you know, anything from safety, nickel, corner. You know, might just depend on need or where South Carolina feels he, he fits in best. But, you know, if you look at him as a potential safety, you know, he's a willing tackler. Obviously, like you said, Wes, he's not the biggest kid, uh, but he, he can run. That's pretty evident on film. Um, he's willing to be physical, even though he's not the biggest guy. Um, he's good in quick areas. You know, he can move. He can flip his hips. So looks like a pretty good early pickup. And, again, you know, I think some of the things that you mentioned with South Carolina, you know, coming off a, a less than stellar season, obviously, the 2021 class in state being weak, having to go out and, and get some guys out of state and sort of trusting your eyes, trusting your evaluations early, I think is a, a good, solid early pickup for them. Chris, how are his hips as you're watching his film? <laughs> They're good. I said he could flip them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so you, did. you can flip okay. them. All right. What was it, Mike? Doesn't actually, listen to us when we yeah. talk. <laughs> he's so he's focused on the next question, yeah. coming up with good questions, no, coming just, up with good uh, discussion points. But like Mike Mayock would say, was he say oily hips? 
Oily yeah, oily hips. hips. That's, that's a good thing. That, he, that comes, is, he, he comes up with some good ones. That is a weird man. phrase. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I, I think, uh, you know, talking to some guys in Georgia this morning, um, he's got a little bit of dog in him, which you always want in DBs. Probably more, from what I've heard, of a nickel type. Um, could he maybe play all three like Chris said? Yes, but I, I think ideally not the guy you're going to put out on the edge on the island more – um, you know, put him inside at nickel, maybe maybe at safety as well, and and I think that's probably the best fit for him, at least looking at what he is right now. But I, you know, this is a guy I think we're going to have to wait and learn more about during camp season, see him a bit more. Um, I think this sort of came out of nowhere for for everybody. Um, you know, I, I don't think this was anticipated in the state of Georgia either. So uh, we'll see where this one goes. I, I think three star guy right now, that's probably about right based on what we know about him. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll see. So you mentioned that he was on campus this past weekend and I'll, I'll get to some of the other guys that were on campus in South Carolina. It's got a lot of junior weekends coming up, obviously this past weekend, the following weekend, I think you mentioned, uh, the weekend after that as well, Wes. So we'll, you know, keep y'all up to date on everyone that's visiting campus from that potential class of 2021 for South Carolina. But this is something that I'm just curious about uh, in terms of when guys decide when a school will decide to offer somebody because, you know, there were some nice offers here, you know, Minnesota and Oregon who were both, you know, right there in the mix for winning their conferences at the very, very end of the season. So, uh, you know, a couple of competitive offers there, although, you know, not super close to home. So maybe that played into it for uh, DeMarco Williams. Not exactly sure. Uh, Pittsburgh and Toledo had also offered, but it's not like this is a stacked offer list. And I imagine a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's very early on in the process or, you know, maybe even just that, like you mentioned, Wes, he's a three star right now. He's probably a three star. Doesn't sound like he's anyone that is necessarily primed to make that leap into four star territory. So for South Carolina, what's the hurry essentially? You know, for a three star guy that you feel like is going to be there, that, like I said, has some competitive offers, but no one as competitive as South Carolina locally. What do you? What, what's the? I guess the thought process for the coaching staff in, in terms of trying to get this guy committed. You know, on January twenty first of twenty twenty. Well, I think uh, first of all, like we said, nobody. Until last night, nobody currently committed to South Carolina for 2021. Um, you really run the risk if if a guy tries to commit and you, you know, turn him away. You kind of run the risk of uh, ticking the kid off, ticking his family off, and uh, you know, I, I don't know if the, the school doesn't really always get to control. You know, when a guy's going to commit. If if a guy calls and say, you know, says I want to be a gamecock, and then. Uh, you say yes, obviously you go ahead and take him and you sort of go from there. If school says no, um, maybe the kid gets 15 offers this spring and <laughs> says, well, you know, forget you guys. I'm going right. to look at these other 15 offers because I tried to commit and y'all said no. So I, I think <laughs> it's more about it, the school kind of has to – now, Now, don't get me wrong. There's kids everywhere that have, quote, offers and they call and the school says, eh, let's, you know, let's hold off. Mm-hmm. and but th- But that's – up to the school, I think, and up to the coaches to kind of have a vibe and have a, a good enough feel for um, can you hold a guy off and are you willing to to deal with the repercussions because sometimes there are repercussions to, to turn a kid away. So this had more to do with Williams in South Carolina and for the Gamecocks it was like we are interested enough in this kid and his upside that it's worth it for us to lock him in now rather than you know maybe miss out on him on the back end. Yeah, I think so. And like you know, like we said, he was on campus Saturday. Obviously, had a great time. Um, you know, we'll we'll talk to the we'll talk to the kid today probably. But um, yeah, and I, I get the impression he's probably going to take some more visits as well. Um, just from from some things I've heard, and um, it, it's still very early. But if you're South Carolina, I think it's just about getting on the board and and getting a guy committed. And again, they're recruiting his teammate too, so. That kind of plays into that as well. Um, you know, if you want both those guys, then, you know, you don't want to go about taking one of them off. So, um, you know, we'll see. So we've talked about how, I don't want to say how little impact what happens on the field has on recruiting, because obviously there is a relationship there. But South Carolina proved after going 4-8 and eight this season and still signing a really, really good class for 2020, a lot of those relationships that have been started and solidified before the season. So maybe it wouldn't be until 2021 that you start to see the impact of that. But do you think that a recruiting class, I guess let's let's say the performance of a recruiting class, like what South Carolina did to put together the 2020 class and what they're going to do when they put together the finishing touches on it in just a couple of weeks, has as much to do with the 2021 class as what they do on the field? Or is that a bridge too far? 
So if the 2020 class... Like, are the 2021 kids looking more at who South Carolina is bringing in in 2020 and being like, I played with this guy, I know this guy, I look up to this guy, that makes me more inclined to go to South Carolina? Or are they looking more at, well, Carolina was 4-10 and last year, let's see how they do this year to to, to gauge my interest in the school. I think it probably depends on the kid. Um, But certainly if you have, it it always helps, uh, in my experience, for a school to have a guy already on campus, um, especially when it's like, a year or two separation, not like for, you know, where the guy's going to be gone by the time you get there. But, um, you know, you, you look at Sumter right now, Justice Boone, arguably the top kid in the class for 2021 in state. And uh, you have O'Donnell Fortune at South Carolina. And uh, he just got there. He was an early enrollee. You now have a direct bridge to that kid. And you have someone on campus. Now, you know, frankly, that that can work against you too. If a kid gets there and he's not happy, and um, you know it's not what he thought it is, then, then it works against against you. But I, I think you look at at Sumter and you look at Justice Boone. Um, I think South Carolina's strong with him. I think OD Fortune helps Carolina there. But then I think you look at um, at a uh, Ty Lee Craft or Tyree Craft, who is at um, at going to be at North Carolina, signed with the Tar Heels, also from Sumter. He's going to be working in for North Carolina a bit and. Um, I tend to think that it's probably too early to know what Justice Boone's going to do. He seems somewhat enamored with some of the out-of-state schools like a Florida, um, you know, Oklahoma because they're big names. But my gut feel, just talking with the kid and knowing that situation, I think it's probably going to end up coming down to South Carolina and North Carolina. That's just uh, that's me educated, you know, taking an educated guess a bit. But I don't think that it's a coincidence that you also have two teammates that he trusts and that he knows and he talks with, you know, at, at those two schools. So recruiting, every kid has something a little bit different that he's looking for. And then you have to throw in, what are the what are the close but external factors, be it mom, dad, coach, uncle who's involved, you know, what, where, what are they pushing? What things are important to them? There are so many variables involved um, that, that can affect a recruitment. But I look at recruiting – as eliminate as many things that an opposing coach can use against you. If the schools that recruit the absolute best have no negatives. Um, South Carolina has a negative of tradition, and right now they have the negative of four wins. So if you're looking for, if it's a kid that values tradition and absolutely wants to compete for a national championship, you're probably out with him. If it's a kid that wants to play early, do his own thing, just does not care about what happened 15 years ago, but says, okay, this is an SEC school, facilities are now top-notch, great fan support, huge stadium, uh, great education, you're going to graduate, then you're in the game with that guy. So, um, honestly, the schools that have, like, no – if you're if you're the school, eliminate as many. Getting the football ops building does that rem, does that directly land any single prospect? Probably not directly, but does that eliminate a possible negative that a school could have against you? Absolutely. Is that something you could point mm-hmm. to? Absolutely. So I I I think uh, it all depends on the kid. But the the more things you can strike out as being something someone can use against you, the better overall you're going to be able to recruit. Or or you can you know like you mentioned the ops building. That that's a tool that you can use to maybe get a maybe it pushes a kid over the top of you know I really do want to go visit there I want to go check that out yeah you know it's something that like we we've seen a lot of people they sort of some people not all sort of equated the ops building with okay South Carolina should now immediately sign a top ten class what we haven't seen any benefit from paying. Fifty million dollars from this building, but it has it is absolutely. I mean, we we can say for sure we've talked to these kids, their families, et cetera, a lot of other people about you know getting Marshawn Lloyd on campus for the first time. He raved about it. Um, that was something that maybe he would have visited anyway. We don't know for sure, but they were able to use that as just one tool to be able to get him on campus. And once he came on campus, he saw it, he loved it. Um, that was, like Wes was saying, a different type of kid. Marshawn Lloyd was not a guy that wanted to go to a name-brand program. Had he wanted to, 
building wouldn't have mattered as much. He probably would have loved it. He would have loved the visit. He'd still like Thomas Brown. He'd still like South Carolina. Probably would have gone somewhere else. Um, but if it can help you get a guy that you are going to have a shot with or, you know, something we've heard from prospects before is it, it was way nicer than I thought or it met my expectations or exceeded my expectations, um, you got to use those those tools. And Wes, you won the day for using external factors. Very Saban and Muschamp-esque. I'll say, is that, is that word. The, that's the keyword for today? See external how many times factors. we can fit that into the yeah, podcast? Yeah, that's a good one. So what do most schools' 2021 classes look like right now on January 22nd? <laughs> all like over nothing? the map. All over? All Are over there the people map, that have yeah. already landed 10 commitments? Do most people have like two or three? Is Carolina behind the eight ball with just well, this one? Well, and not even talking about we'll, – we'll dig through some of the numbers, but um, – you know, even without looking into into the numbers, you know, you can just sort of tell, you know, South Carolina right now does not have as much recruiting momentum, I guess you could say, just in terms of, um, you know, committed numbers as some other schools, but also just, you know, some leans and things like that. And that's a natural thing to expect for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, coming off a subpar season. Number two, obviously, there's going to be some, um, you know, some chatter or whatever, that those things don't affect recruitments as much if it's just some random guy writing a column about a hot seat rating and putting Will Mush. That doesn't matter as much. When the president of the university comes out and says it, then then that has more of a tangible effect, which well, we've Bobby seen. C. Right. So we've seen that. So those, th- those things can matter, um, and, and you wouldn't anticipate, given all those factors, that South Carolina is going to be racking up, you know, 10 top-flight commitments here in, in January for the 2021 class. Now, I think this spring and this summer will more tell the story because guys are committing earlier and earlier now. South Carolina a lot of times has, you know, half the class or 30% of the class committed by the summer, maybe more, maybe less, depending on the year. Um, Will we see that this year? I don't really know. Right now you couldn't project it, but it could get there this spring or this summer. Uh, Wes has some of the numbers for some of the Yeah, I do. I think it's kind of interesting. Sometimes fans that don't follow the day-to-day of recruiting will just look at that number and be like, you know, this school only has this many guys committed. This school, it's re- at, at any given point until you get towards the end, it's about are you getting quality versus quantity, I think. Now, you start getting to the end, if you have five commits and it's almost signing day, that's that's you're in trouble. Then you're Southern Cal. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you're like, what what is going on here? But a lot of times it depends on when when do the kids that you want, when do they personally want to commit? Um, if you have a bunch of, sometimes it works out where a bunch of them just want to get it over with. The growing trend I'm noticing with the early signing period is, I believe, Chris, and I don't have the numbers to back it, I believe the end of summer. I've heard more guys say, I want to be committed by end of summer. Yeah. Because I think there's a growing trend of get it over with before my senior year and then sign in December as opposed to having the stress of getting ready for a commitment right before the early signing period. Yep. And I think the high school coaches, the ones that are savvy and the ones that are, you know, involved in recruiting are saying, "Look, you can take your official visits during the summer now. You couldn't in the past." The ones that are savvy are saying Take all your officials in June, July, and then let me have your undivided attention August and forward. Mm -hmm. So you're still going to have your guys that wait it out. You always will. But the growing trend to me is going to be to continue to see a push for um, or a large string of commitments, I think, in that June to August window. Uh, You'll have some guys in the spring. But just throw, throw in all the things I just talked about, plus the fact that guys are on campus for camps. Um, the summer is is a huge commitment window now. Um, just off the top of your heads, how what do you what number do you think is the highest that any school has committed right now? Seven. Admittedly, I already looked. Uh, so, Chris, what did you think before you looked? Yeah, before I looked, I probably would have said like. The highest. I probably would have said like an outlier of like some school somehow had like 10 or 11. See, 11 was about what I thought. Um, Right now you have Florida and Ohio State with nine. Um, 
Those are the so only kind of two. Split the middle on that. I said seven. Y'all said eleven. Those are the only two that have nine. Wisconsin has eight. Uh, Miami, Texas, Notre Dame, seven. Um, there are, and this is this was a very fast rough count. There are twenty seven schools that have three or more. The rest of the country has two or less. So, uh, and again, a lot of times these things sort of come in spurts. So you can go from having being low on this list to being, you know, towards the top in one weekend. Because I, what was it? There was a, there was like five commits in a row at one point in one weekend last year for South Carolina. So a lot of times these things sort of come in spurts. But yeah, South Carolina with one. Um, I mean, there are several schools that still have zero. So um, that's sort of where it is right now. The reason I ask is because when you look at the 2020 class, and I, I looked very closely at the 2020 class in that I said this is a bellwether for this staff. If Carolina can keep the 2020 class together, I think that's, yeah, that's that's the right word. Why don't you just, mouth at me over there? No, I just, I, I just. Bellwether? I, maybe that's not the right word. I think that's the right word. I just didn't know what it meant. Uh, will you, will you Google it for me now while I finish this little mini rant just to make sure I use it correctly? I absolutely will. And we'll leave this in just in uh, case I'm wrong. The leading sheep of a flock. With a bell on its neck, doesn't apply as much. But the second one, an indicator or predictor of something. Cool, very so good. So I, I, I figured the the it's I did the twenty. Yeah, no. uh, education. Where's uh, Kimry? Let's get him in yeah. here. Oh man, yeah. Uh, <laughs> as a word of the day, it's Boogie point. and Jordan yeah. Birch will both use that word in their introductory <laughs> press conferences. That and external <laughs> factors, external factors and bellwethers. Uh, I, I view the twenty twenty class as very much a bellwether for the long term. And not even like long term success, but just like long term viability of this staff. And that I, I thought if Carolina could keep this class together and land Birch, which they did, that it would be obviously a boon for the future. And it is. But the more I've thought about it and the further we've gotten away from National Signing Day, I've started to think maybe I think there that could be a false positive for South Carolina because of what I mentioned earlier. So many of those relationships were formed before the season and those guys had the relationships with the assistants with Will Muschamp with maybe even some players on the roster there was enough there that the 4 and 8 season wasn't enough to deter them but the 2021 class now the 4 and 8 season could be something that you know as i mentioned earlier could almost inhibit carolina from getting in the room with some of these guys so i guess i feel like this class is now maybe the the really really crucial one and the other thing that i wonder with the controversies that are swirling around this program and yes, it's it's obviously been quelled for this offseason. Will Muschamp and his staff are going to be in Columbia for at least one more year. But if next year goes anything like 2019 did, I think you're having this conversation even more earnestly than people were last year. I think there's still a very real chance. This is still a very fragile position that South Carolina is in right now. There's a very real chance that Will Muschamp could get fired next year. If Carolina goes 4-8, and eight, I think that absolutely has to be in the cards. So the 2021 class feels a little bit more fragile, and so I feel like it's more important than ever for South Carolina to basically have their class together before the season on the off chance that things do start to go south. And I don't know how feasible it is to do that, given that they're coming off of a 4-8 and eight season. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it, it is going to be critical for this team, and, and that's a question, you know, a little bit of a sidebar. People say, well, how many games do they need to win? I don't really know. I haven't heard some magic number, but I think it's safe to say that, you know, probably the your sort of baselines this team needs to get back to bowl eligibility i mean i think i think you probably start there there could be these other guys want free socks from belk that's that's what they want <laughs> well the belt bowl is going away though right <laughs> yeah it's going to be the something else bowl now that's disappointing yeah it is. well i would love a shopping spree to belt personally would you? seriously yeah oh yeah I well could. everything's always like 90 percent off there which is so nice we get more we go buy more shirts that we never wear yeah true yeah I, i've but I don't know. I don't like how most of their shirts fit, but I get pants from there a lot and socks. Okay. Which, yeah, and you're right. Their, their quote, sales, it's like, well, if everything is always on sale, everything is always yeah, then on that's sale. just what it costs. I will never right. forget. I was down at the beach one time. This was years ago. I was in, like, middle school or high school, and I saw a commercial for, I don't know, just like a hibachi place down there, like near Polly's or near Myrtle or something like that, and it was like, you know, steak is 25% off. Monday through Sunday, and I was like, wait a second. Like, what day is steak full price? If it's never full price, then it's never 20% discount. So, yeah, same thing. But uh, I guess shout out Belk. Thanks for, yeah. sponsor- shout out to Belk. <laughs> Thanks for sponsoring this podcast, Belk. Yeah. <laughs> Slash I hope, that, S. I hope that the new, whatever the Belk Bowl is, 
I hope they have the same people running their social media because yeah, they actually are actually doing an outstanding job. Anyway, that's uh, that was that's a, a sidebar for another day. Yeah, that's, so, that's the off season. For you. To, but to address, I think your original question was, you know, navigating through another season, you know, and and having to start from scratch, you know, going yeah. going into a season with these questions on the front end of the recruiting process instead of on the back end. How much of a difference does that make? No, it it makes a difference. I mean, and and again, I think that when you when you go into it like you are now, I mean, even the the twenty look, recruiting so far, you know, everything's so fast and you're so far ahead with all these guys. The twenty twenty one class, these are guys you've been recruiting for two or three years for the most part. Um, not all, but a lot of them. You know, some of your base guys you, you really have begun to build a relationship with, whether it was last summer in camp or some of them, like I said, for two or three years. So um those relationships definitely matter and they're very, very important in recruiting, but at some point, you you have to have that return, and so when Muschamp first got to Columbia, there's you know they they utilized their connections from you know past stops or whatever it may have been to get some guys interested. In the first couple of years, they were able to slowly build up. They had the nine win season, and that illustrated progress. Um, and there've been some other things that have illustrated progress too. They took a sort of a dive last year with the record, and so that's why maybe it's a little bit tougher to build that momentum this spring, this summer, this preseason. And but if they can still stay in the game with some guys, um, and then you show some progress during the season, and you sort of turn things around, then all that stuff calms down a little bit, right? And 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 it helps out. I think it's just everything is more magnified for a program like South Carolina because it's not, you know, Alabama or something like that, or Georgia, you know, to use some teams in their own conference or in the LSU. Um, it, it, it's not even you know Auburn you know, uh, or anything like that where, you know, we've seen Auburn, even though Gus Malzahn's on the hot seat every other year on average, um, you know, they're still able to generally recruit pretty well. And, and that's because, again, they can fall back on some of these things like tradition and trophies and And the fact the that amount they beat of wins. Nick Saban more consistently than anyone has ever beaten Nick Saban. Yes, <laughs> this is that's true. That's a big one. That is a big one. And so um, I think all those things weigh in and, and it makes it more critical – at a place like South Carolina. So the fact that I, I think, in my opinion, now look, the 4-8 and eight season, that was stuff created by the South Carolina football program, not by anybody else, not by, you know, we talked about some of the other external factors. It wasn't you know, our fault. Bob, Bob Caslin and, and you know, not having trophy. I mean, Will Muschamp has nothing to do with South Carolina's football history other than when he has been at the helm. He has nothing to do with that. So when you do have things like that and then you couple it with a poor season, um, you know, really it just magnifies, it makes it even more difficult. So the I say that to say the fact that South Carolina signed the class that it has signed and will sign is pretty impressive given all those things. It's tremendous, but that's why, again, I think if you're a Carolina fan, it is reasonable to be concerned about the 2021 class, not because you only have one commitment and Florida has nine, and, you know, DeMarco Williams being a three-star guy isn't anything that necessarily moves the needle or makes you think that Carolina is going to be competing for a national championship in 2023 or 2024, but even if Carolina is able to turn things around, if they're able to have the opposite of in, the opposite injury luck they've had the last two years, and they stay completely healthy for the entire season, Ryan Helensky looks great, and you know Xavier Legat emerges as a legitimate number one or number two receiving option. All these things go out, and Carolina somehow turns the season around to eight and four. The way that the recruiting cycle, the way that the recruiting calendar functions now, it's going to be too late to put together a great class, pretty much, unless you've already unless you've basically assembled that by the beginning of the season. So what can Carolina do between January 22nd and the end of August to put together a class that continues the forward momentum and progress that the 2020, that the 2020 class has maintained? Well, I do think they're going to have to do a really good job this spring and this summer. And certainly, the, I mean, I think these junior days that they had last week, have this coming week and, and February 1st, those are going to be key, right? And, um, we already saw one return from those. We, we've talked to a bunch of the guys. I think they did a really nice job of luring some guys in for those, and, and they've had strong visits. So that'll give them a good base for some guys. Um, you know, a lot of those guys they've already been recruiting or maybe even already had on campus before, but summer camp will be big. I think it'll be important for them to pick up a few guys this spring and this summer that are attainable, that want to decide then, maybe find some guys in camp like they typically do and have a base going into the season. There are going to be some guys that – you know, really, I think just staying in the game with some guys. I talked about that earlier. Just staying in the game and then ha- having that good season 
to where the guys that maybe like South Carolina, but they're going, look, I like everything, but we need to see some progress. If they can see that this year, then maybe you can carry it in throughout the season and be able to land those guys in December or maybe even in February. So um, a lot of these guys, it depends on the timing, but they're, they're going to have to, you know, have a combination of sort of getting some guys early that they can get. Um, not taking, I'm not saying taking prospects that are reaches. You don't want to do that. Um, but taking some guys that you feel like you can get that are good players and just sort of trusting your eyes on it and then staying in the game with some of the bigger kids. And to bring it back to Williams, I guess what that means for South Carolina is that, or that should be an indicator that they felt good enough about his upside, even if he's a three-star guy now, maybe even a little bit of a tweener given the type of defensive backs that South Carolina likes to recruit, like a little bit smaller, probably not as big as someone that could be recruited to play safety. Obviously, you can fix a lot of the stuff when you get a guy on campus in your nutrition program and working with Paul Jackson, having DeMarco Williams looking like DK Metcalf in four years, which is just going to be the, the gold standard for everybody now. Uh, but these junior weekends do become increasingly important, you know, not only for South Carolina to cultivate a relationship, but to be able to scout these guys, to get an early look at some guys that you feel like might be those diamonds in the rough. Because even if Carolina does get things turned around, they're not going to be the front runner for the majority of four and five star prospects that they're going to encounter. So with that, we talked about the guys that were going to be on campus this past weekend. Obviously, DeMarco Williams, one of them. Who were some of the other guys that were on campus for the junior day this past weekend? Well, one of them that really comes to mind and, and jumps sort of off the page, Thaddeus Franklin. He's a 2021 running back um, out of South Florida. And he's interesting because, you know, he was a very early commitment to Miami when Thomas Brown was still there. And so he committed to Miami when Brown was on staff. Um, when Brown took the South Carolina job, Franklin did remain committed to Miami for a while. He he backed off that fairly recently, but we started hearing as soon as Brown got the job that, hey, this is a guy that will probably give South Carolina a second look. So, um, you know, that that was one that came to mind. Dylan, he's a grown man. Grown man, big, like, big four-star running back. I yeah. wouldn't. I don't know if he's necessarily quite Marshawn Lloyd, but I think he's he's up there. Like this is yeah. when you start talking about the type of backs Carolina has been in on since Thomas Brown has uh, taken over. This guy's a dude. I, I think there's probably four or five guys in the class of 2021 at running back that Carolina's going to have a shot. They're obviously probably not, they're not going to land all of them. They probably won't land two of them, but if they can land one of these four or five guys that um, they've identified early on at running back, then they'll have a great class at that position to stack with Marshawn Lloyd. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. All right. Oh, no problem. Um, you know, not, two, well, more than two, but a couple offensive linemen that come to mind, Cedric Nicely last Saturday from Georgia, a teammate of Makia Scott, Gainesville, Georgia. He's a guy that South Carolina likes a lot. The next day on Sunday, Dylan Fairchild, um, who's a really good high school wrestler and a guy that had, had really never played offensive line on the field before last summer at camp. Eric Wolford worked him out there and offered him, ended up offering him, and now he's got offers from Tennessee and Georgia Tech as well and um, joined by his mom on the visit, had a really good one. Four-star tight end Jordan Dingle out of Kentucky. Justice Boone, in-state guy Wes mentioned earlier. Dejon Reynolds, who's a four-star guy out of Georgia. Um, they took the lead for, is it Victuan Brown? Mm -hmm. um, Victuan Brown out of Grayson, Georgia, 2021 Russian. So that a kid lot of guys. was very, very excited about yeah. the visit. Yeah. So a bunch of guys, a bunch of names. I mean, that, that's certainly not all of them, but just sort of a, Did you a say sampling Daywan of a few Wells? of them. Yeah, Daywan. Yeah, okay. Daywan, yep, yep. The question that's on everybody's mind now, why didn't South Carolina get Jadavian's cousin? He, he was a guy that, um, you know, later in the process, L LSU had – an interesting finish to their recruiting class, and they they sort of parted ways with more than one guy. He was one of them. Um, Clowney was, and so Demon Clowney, that is right. And so South Carolina took a look. You know, South Carolina, a bunch of schools took a look. He um, ends up he's he's committed to Ole Miss, and he's just not someone that South Carolina opted to go on. You know, they're constantly looking at guys and evaluating. Obviously, we'll see in a couple few years. You know, whether it's guys in their class or not in their class, or guys they just didn't get or didn't recruit or whatever if that was the right answer or not, but that's sort of where it's at. Makes sense that somebody named Demon would be more of a Lane Kiffin guy. Is that fair to say? Ooh. <laughs> no, I really do love Lane Kiffin. I just think that that's funny. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I kind of feel bad for making fun of someone's name. I can't make fun of people's names. Pearson isn't a real name, or at least it's a last name. But <laughs> I don't know. Real it's just, I, I guess, huh. that's just, that's tough. That's really yeah. tough. I, I'm sure he's a nice kid. 
But for a football, at least he's a football player. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, that's true. It'd be different if he were like a stockbroker. <laughs> yeah, if you're a football player, that's a pretty, pretty cool name. A yeah, I, I don't know, but, but like I don't know, different kind of cool than like Tank. It's like ooh, Tank, that's cool. Um, demon. I mean, you want you want to be a demon on the football field. I just hope that it's you don't really want to be one off the field. Is right. The problem. You just hope. I ha- I've had this conversation a lot with people lately. I don't know why, but I just keep going back to Romeo and Juliet. When Juliet say, says, uh, you know, what's in a name? Just the the whole philosophy of, uh, you know, what, what's in a name? I don't know. I, you hope on the football field a lot for someone named Demon and off the field not so much. I don't know. I just thought that was very interesting. I, I, I thought it was a nickname, and based on all the research that I have done in the last two days, that is not, in fact, the nickname. Uh, but anyway, so he's going to Ole Miss. So it's not even worth mentioning other than it was Jadavian's cousin. Some other guys that are going to be on campus, you mentioned the next two weekends, are also going to be hosting a lot of juniors. Are South Carolina, who are the Gamecocks expecting to get a look at this weekend? Um, well, you got a couple of big ones this weekend. Uh, a couple of in-state guys, Robbie Utes from Rock Hill. He's a tight end prospect that has really blown up um, here recently, and really the word has just started to get out on him. He's going to be, I think, safe to say, a top five in-state guy. I mean, right now he's not uh, ranked by rivals, but um, the – He's a top five prospect. The official in the state. Chris and West Jam got central rankings. He is a uh, top five guy in state. Uh, will be on campus. I think really for the first time, as far as taking an in depth look at South Carolina, he visited this past year for Alabama game. Uh, had a good time, but first like real in depth look, he'll get a chance to hang out with Joe Cox for the first time and get to know him as the new tight ends coach. So I, I think a big weekend for for South Carolina with him. Virginia Tech has been very, very involved with him, got in on him early. Um, you know, he's not naming favorites, but those are the schools I'm looking at as being big with Robbie. Um, Duke, as far as their education, he's an academic-oriented kid too. So I, I think Duke is at least in the conversation. But big weekend for them with him. Um, Ty Ingram Dawkins, who's a defensive lineman out of Gaffney. There's been some switching around with his visit. He was a, originally going to be in – um, I think this past weekend, then he was going to be in February 1. Now the plan is for him to be at South Carolina on this Saturday. He was at Tennessee last weekend. He'll be at South Carolina this weekend. He'll be at Georgia on February 1. And um, another kid that's recruitment has just sort of taken off. Um, South Carolina uh, wants him. He's a priority target, I, I think, as far as the in-state guys for, you know, one of just a few priority in-state guys. So, um I don't really know how many other uh, guys are out there for this week. I, it sounds like the numbers might be a little bit smaller this week, but but we'll see. Um, there's the other kid, uh, Patrick. Uh, you remember the Tukes. last Patrick? What is it? Patrick Tukes, the yeah, big defensive Patrick Tukes, lineman. Yep. Yeah, impressive um, guy. They've recently offered him. They'll get him in on on Saturday as well. Um, he's out of Georgia. Um, a kid with some upside too. So. Those are, I think those are the three main three ones I know about right now that are like priority guys. Do you know of any other ones for this Saturday right you, now? You got it right there. I mean, I'm sure we'll have more this oh, week. Yeah, they'll they'll oh, pop yeah. up, but um, that's the guys to watch right now. Obviously, keep you all posted on everything going on with the 2021 class, as we have discussed. This is a really, really important stretch for South Carolina and identifying those guys and developing the relationships. I don't know how many commits necessarily to expect in these next three weeks. I think anything that you do get in terms of a verbal commit is kind of gravy at this point. But this is when you have to really sow those seeds and say, hey, this team's not going to be 4-8 and eight this year. You want to come be a part of this program and come play with Jordan Birch and Marshawn Lloyd and Alex Huntley and Luke Doty and Rico Powers and Dominic Hill. And, uh, hey, you know, you remember Makia Sky. I used to play together in high school. So, you know, come play with your former teammate, be teammates again here at South Carolina. And obviously we'll keep you all up to date on all that right here on Another Carolina Podcast. And then for more in-depth blow-by-blow stuff, we only do this on Wednesdays, you know. It's it's kind of a, you know, scarcity principle. We want to keep y'all wanting more. So we we can't do this every day, but if you do want recruiting nuggets every single day of your life, every single hour, gamecockcentral.com is where to go for all the best insider information. You got to subscribe for a lot of the good stuff, uh, but if you want to try it out for a month for free and you've never been a subscriber to Gamecock Central, you can use the exclusive podcast code GCPod and you can be an insider on gamecockcentral.com for a month. For free, for 30 days for free, I should say it like that. So if you do it in February, I guess you'll get the first 29 days of February and then the first day of March. So even more than a month 
if you do it for February. But yeah, GamecockCentral.com is the best place to keep up with everything going on with the 2021 class for South Carolina. As far as the 2020 class, South Carolina is going to put the finishing touches on that here in the next couple of weeks. The late signing period begins two weeks from today, February 5th. And South Carolina pretty much knows who's going to be filling that out. And we'll have a full primer for you next week. But a couple of guys that have had some updates since we last spoke. And we will get started with the Boogie Huntley, Jordan Birch combo that so many people are so intrigued by. I'll have a good piece up on the site, uh, the latest on Boogie Huntley. Wes, Chris, what is the latest with the Huntley Boogie, or excuse me, the Huntley Birch, <laughs> Boogie Huntley, Jordan Birch duo that Carolina is expecting to put pen to paper here in two weeks? Well, given that neither signed, you know, questions of, of different varieties have persisted with both. And so one, the one with Huntley, um, was whether or not he'd visit Georgia before he ended up signing. Everything has seemed positive and, and good with South Carolina and solid, but um, given that he said on the record, you know, hey, I may take a visit for Georgia or I'll probably take a visit to Georgia, it's sort of a question. So he finally got word yesterday that he's not going to take a visit to Georgia. So I think sort of officially closed the book on that. You know, Jordan Birch obviously is a guy that's not really going to didn't even talk on his commitment ceremony day, so probably not going to be saying much. But everything still seems fine there, too. You know, the expectation is that those guys are going to both sign with South Carolina when the time comes, February 5th, and a couple really good in-state defensive linemen pickups for for the Gamecocks there. Not only are they good potential defensive linemen, good high school defensive linemen that project to be very good college defensive linemen, uh, but also pretty decent basketball players is my understanding. I know Boogie's a lax player. Um, I actually coached him in church league basketball last year, so I've seen his basketball prowess up close and in person, uh, but a little bit different in church league than playing for an actual high school. Now, Birch has played for a while, and Wes, you got a chance to see both of them ball, what, last night? Yeah, I uh, was over at Hammond, my second home these days, uh, checking those guys out, and um, dude, for one, Jordan Birch is a very skilled basketball player. Um, They actually beat Trinity Burns, which I, I believe from what they were saying, what I heard just around the game, is a pretty good skis of basketball team. And um, Jordan Birch actually plays guard uh, for for Hammond. But, um, you know, th- this kid is good. He's skilled. Uh, he made some plays. And uh, Boogie Huntley, um, you know, I-, I don't think he quite has the basketball background that Jordan has, but he made some plays too, made uh, – you know, is pretty skilled with the ball himself. Uh, is able to use his wide frame to like back dudes down. And just, dude, there was one play where it was it was kind of a loose ball, um, but the Trinity Burns kid grabbed it and got both hands on it first. And uh, Boogie was just like, "No, I'm you're not grabbing this ball," and just literally grabbed it. And it was about to be a tie up, but he just snatched the ball away so fast that there wasn't a tie up. It was just like. I'm stronger than anyone on this court, so I'm just going to take the basketball. What uh, was that? Offensive rebound, defensive rebound? Um, believe that was an offensive rebound. Okay, I was going to ask if he had any sick offensive rebounds because if so, I taught him everything I know about crashing the offensive glass. You know, he did mention that. Yeah, to, he did. Uh, I, I figured he would I, in I, the post game. I, I know it made an impact. I, t- yeah. I taught him the Moses Malone move where you where you just kind of like drift under the basket, like almost out of bounds, and then you just back out. <laughs> You know, just use your ass and just back all the way out and grab the offensive rebound. It worked really well in church basketball. Um, but Will Muschamp has, has been specific about that, you know, liking to see how guys play other sports. And, I mean, it's not it's not a, a crazy or, or particularly innovative idea. I Actually, I'm reading a book right now. It's really cool uh, by David Epstein called Range. And it basically, the book starts with Tiger Woods versus Roger Federer and how they have incredibly disparate approaches to being at the tops of their respective games. And it's a really interesting look at basically specialization over the course of your entire life versus versatility. And his, I guess, supposition is that what Tiger Woods did, you know, having his dad basically may make him play golf from the time that he could walk is sort of a, an exception, not the rule. And that most people, if you're going to be very su- successful at something, whether it's sports, whether it's, you know, business or whatever, it helps to have a very diverse background. So like Roger Federer, didn't start playing tennis seriously until he was like 16 or 17, apparently. And even then, they were like trying to move him up to like play higher levels of tennis. And he was like, nah, I'm just going to play the lower level so I can hang out with my friends. And then, you know, is the greatest tennis player of all time. And it sounds like Will Muschamp, has, you know, sort of believes in, in that approach and obviously has no issues with Birch and Boogie playing basketball. I feel like some coaches would be a little bit leery that their crown jewels of their recruiting classes might get hurt. But Will Muschamp yeah. sees a lot of value in 
playing different sports and having a versatile skill set. Yeah, and mo- most of the guys, I don't, I don't know the numbers are from you right now, but most of the guys that make it um, to a high professional level um, played multiple sports growing up. And, you know, I, I think especially sports like baseball, football, um, if you do the same movements over and over and over like year round you i think there's more and more research that says you wear down your your muscles and you're more likely to get injured in specific areas for those sports because you're doing the same athletic movements over and over and over again and these guys that um play different sports uh, you know a lot of football kids are in the basketball you're seeing more and more i think football kids that also wrestle uh, football and track have always been sort of uh um group together as well but that I think is so good for a guy's athletic development to be able to do different movements and train in different ways and then you know once they get to college they can start to narrow down and focus on on just football but that was fun man I mean you look out there on the court and for for Hammond local private school you had Jordan Birch number one defensive end in the country five-star guy everybody knows Alex Huntley four-star defensive lineman um, you look across though, Tucker Toman, who is also on the baseball team, committed to LSU uh, to play baseball there, and is um, the uh, son of uh, Toman that used to be at South Carolina, the assistant coach, and um, then uh, Fabian Goodman, who is a walk-on football player for South Carolina, he's on the basketball team as well. So you're, I mean, dude, across the board, this basketball team has some abs- absolute studs that, that play other sports uh, at Hammond or are going to play in college. So you're saying if, for some reason, the NCAA decided, okay, you can only recruit X many guys for all sports, South Carolina would be the best at football and basketball? Like if you just had to combine, you had to recruit for all sports. You know, you only get 25 recruits per class for the football team, for the basketball team, for the baseball team. Carolina would be dominating. Uh, maybe not. I know back back when I was in school, there were like whispers on campus about the about the football team being able to beat the basketball team in a pickup game. When were uh, you were at Carolina? What, that like was like the 07, Sydney Rice, 08? Sydney Rice years. Yeah. When were you? No, yeah, when were you at Carolina? I, yeah, I graduated. Oh wait. So oh wait. Oh five to oh eight or oh four to oh eight. Yeah. Okay. Oh wow. But yeah, like um, Sydney Rice. That basketball team won a won an NIT. That was that was two thousand six, right? They won the NIT. Yes. Wow, and the football team could beat that basketball team. Well, I don't know. You know, people talk. Yeah, yeah. What would you hear? That just yeah, that they could uh, they who, could hang with them. Who was but, the starting five from the football team? See, I, that was so long ago. Okay, I well, who were some of the guys? Come on, you can't drop a juicy detail like I don't, that. I don't think it's that juicy, but Sid, that's Sydney salacious. Rice, Sydney basically, Sydney Rice was probably almost as good as any basketball player on that team. Man, I think was the big takeaway. That's like the South Carolina version of that uh, of that scrimmage that happened in Barcelona when the Dream Team broke up and played apparently the greatest basketball game ever played. That's like the South Carolina version of that. Well, just it, these like secret pickup games. If if you look at the the years where South Carolina was so good at football, um, you could have put together a heck of a basketball. You could you like had Bruce, Bruce Ellington, Ellington and Jarrell Adams. And, yeah, um, Melvin Ingram. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some other guys I think in that team that were really really good at football that I can't or at, at Obviously good at football. <laughs> at basketball too. Um I think Chris has checked out all D- this DJ on this. DJ Swearinger was good at basketball. Yeah, he still has the uh he has a celebrity basketball yeah, tournament. Every he year. was good. Um well I'm trying to think what year he was in the um, yeah, he was like nine to twelve, right? Yes, he was yeah. in the 09 class. So that would have been after you were but DJ Swearinger was good. Cliff Matthews was good. Melvin Ingram was good. Melvin Ingram was good. I think Vic Hampton. I mean, Al, Alshon good. was good. Alshon, that's who I'm, duh. Yeah, We're Alshon was good. Um, Alshon was a monster. Gosh, there's some other guys. I can't think of some of the other guys. But you're also, you know, you're pulling from 85 scholarship guys that's to true. find five. That's true. You know, they... I would love to see that. They need to make that happen at some point. Just just a friendly scrimmage between the football team and and, and sell tickets. Five dollars a ticket. I yeah, DJ Swearinger, I know you have your thing. That that should be something else he does. Wait, I have my Five, thing? No, DJ Swearinger has his thing already. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, his basketball yeah. thing. But yeah. get five you know, or get eight former Gamecock football players and let's get eight former Gamecock basketball players and let's let's see see what happens. I love it.
What was y'all's approach? Were y'all one sport guys, one activity guys? Like y'all are sports writers now. Yeah. Did we all just one track? I'm gonna do journalism. Y'all basically did this in high school. Like did no, y'all had... specialize in things that you did? Did you play different sports? Did you try different like majors and career choices? Or have y'all been pretty one track mind forever? I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to be like, um, you know, career wise mm-hmm. at that age. I was just floating along, honestly. Baseball was my main sport. I played a little bit of football early on, like mm-hmm. middle school years and stuff like that. Um, baseball was always my focus, mm-hmm. um, but did other stuff on the side. Played basketball all growing up, like rec league stuff. Mm-hmm. But that, okay. you know, that's a very different competitive level than playing like high school ball. And so stuff baseball like that. specialist and then career variety. Yes. Although you've pretty much been doing this from from the word go, right? Like you've been doing this for what twelve years? Yeah, since I was so in pretty school. much. Yeah. Okay. What about you, yeah. Chris? Did you have a career before this? A career? Yeah. Like an off... Uh, yeah, did you, like, graduate I thought you were from college and you were like, I'm selling software or I'm selling pharmaceuticals? No, or... I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. Um, when I was uh, in college, I sort of was... I was a political science major. Mm-hmm. I did not go to journalism school or anything. I was a poli-sci major. Um, so I'm glad I have this job because I wouldn't know what I would even do with that degree. Yeah, so what can you tell me about parliamentary democracies? You, nothing. And uh, have no interest in talking about it, <laughs> to be frank. But, um, you know, I, I was a little more interested then. So, um, yeah, I was a poli-sci major and thought about going to law school and sort of started doing this on the side and got the chance to do it. But when I was in college and for a little while after college, while I was still doing like sports writing part time, I was like a legal assistant, I guess you could say, okay. and and worked uh, worked downtown for an attorney down there. And so... Um, that's sort of what I was doing. I That's got a cool. chance to do this full time and went with that. So how has your background preparing for being a lawyer helped you navigate the world of sports writing? I have to argue with people a lot. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> no, not really. Especially me. You have to give no, people yeah. coffee a lot. <laughs> no, I think it, it I don't I don't know, maybe just helping you uh think. I uh, maybe, you know, yeah. I guess. Cool. Not that I never really trained to be a lawyer. Like I didn't go to law school. It's just mm-hmm. something I thought about doing. Um I was I was interested. I still am interested in it. Um I guess maybe that, just the writing part of it, being comfortable with writing, being comfortable with language and correspondence is something that's helpful if you're an attorney, I guess. And your athletic career is pretty one track. Like you were a soccer guy all the way through, right? I didn't re- didn't play soccer really growing up. Really? I mean, early. I never, I didn't Most play in high school. Most people play soccer in, their, in like their 30s, played when they were, right. it's, that's a hard thing to pick up later. I know, I know. And that's why I'm still not all that great at it. That's um, why you keep hurting all. yourself. Yeah, <laughs> probably. No, I ran, I ran track a little bit in okay. high school. What was your event? Um, the 800 is what I ran. I was also not very good at that. Okay. I mean, I was adequate. Yeah. yeah. Serviceable. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. So the life and times, the careers of Wes yeah. Mitchell and Chris Clark. Uh, elsewhere in the 2020 class, talked about Huntley and Birch. Quick update on Zaquandre White. Zaquandre White. Uh, yeah. He, um, that's been an interesting one to track. You know, obviously he put out sort of a commitment uh, announcement, I guess you could say, but we sort of got word right after that the immediate aftermath of it that you know wasn't a done deal and so where it's at right now is South Carolina still pursuing him they still would like to sign him it'd be a nice pickup for them really he's a guy that can really run he's got some wiggle to him um does he have oily hips yeah I don't know if I go that far does he have external I think that's for DBs only yeah external he has had some external factors (laughs) Um, when he was at FSU and things like that. So, he's a bellwether. He leads the flock. But but still a guy that South Carolina like to sign, but the, the deal is, you know, before you sign a guy, you want to check and see, you know, he's a junior college guy, so is he going to be able to transfer? Um, and so they have to check that out. It's nothing on South Carolina's end. They they have to sort of see. The, the final grades, for example, from junior college are not even in. Sometime soon they should be. And so hopefully we'll know more then, but still sort of in a holding pattern there. We'll have a full primer for the late signing period, obviously next week, the week before national signing period. But in the meantime, one more guy I want to get an update on as Will Muschamp is now on the road. How how long is he on the road? And I think he's in Rock Hill today or this week or something visiting prospects. He was there on Monday. He was there Monday. Okay. Yeah. Where is, is he back in Columbia now? I don't know where he's at on okay. today. But he's out Wednesday. seeing people, including Jakari Caldwell. Mm-hmm. What's the latest on Jakari Caldwell? Yeah, he saw Jakari on Monday, watched his basketball game. Um, really, that was, I think, another example of how high South Carolina is on Jakari Caldwell. Uh, Will Muschamp was at his basketball game. Offensive coordinator Mike Bobo was at his basketball game. 
Um, Joe Cox, who obviously new tight ends coach, but is going to take over Rock Hill. Joe Go Cox. Uh, um, Joe Gamecox. Um, Didn't he change his Twitter handle? Is it Joe Gamecox or Joe yeah. Go Cox? Joe Gamecox. Okay, all right. Cool. Uh, I knew he changed his Twitter. Yeah, that's a, that's a great. Um, that the good. most coaches don't really have like some creative Twitter handle. I feel. I like. think so Will's is Coach Will Muschamp. Yeah, that's <laughs> or uh, Coach W Muschamp or something. Yeah. Joe Gamecox is pretty perfect. Yep. Uh, Brian McClendon there as well. So you had four coaches go in. Um, these guys spent all day in Rock Hill watching basketball games. They watched Robbie Oots um, early that day. Then they watched uh, Omega Blake, South Point kid, that does not have an offer from South Carolina yet, but that they're um, sort of evaluating. And then watched Akari Caldwell play that night, uh, met with his family, watched the game with his family, and um, – uh, Jakari was actually on South Carolina's campus over the weekend as well for a uh, unofficial visit, and he's right now currently planning to make his decision on signing day. Uh, the big thing there to watch has been whether Clemson was going to offer. Right now, it looks like probably no offer from Clemson, and um, you know I've I've had my prediction in for South Carolina for probably a month now. Uh, still feel good about that. I think the Gamecocks are in in great shape to. Add Jakari for uh, whenever he is ready to announce. Do you know where else Will is going in the next couple of weeks and whom he is going to see? I don't. You know, I think this time's about. Uh, you know, he, he's been checking in on a lot of the guys that already signed too. He, uh, you know, I, I saw reports from Conway that he was at uh, Taka Hemingway's game last week just to to catch up with him and watch. Um, I guess he was down meeting with Eric Shaw and his family. Um, was that this week or last week that that Shaw picture came out? Um, he was with those guys. So checking in on signees, um, he he's already used his uh, visit, I, I think, with, with Jordan Birch, but John Scott Jr. and Mike Peterson were both at Hammond yesterday watching those guys play basketball. So um, re- really he's probably will have by the end, of, by February 5th, will have stopped in on all the major final targets and commits and will have checked in at least at the high school of the top 2021 guys. He can't meet with the 2021 guys right now, but we'll have stopped by. He uh, Last week he was at Greer, uh, which sure. is home of uh, Raheem Jarrett, and um, big wide receiver. Who's the young big wide receiver from Greer? Um, Jaleel yeah, Jaleel Skinner. And um, I believe stopped by Gaffney, which is where Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, who we talked about earlier, is at. Um, so yeah, he, uh, he's going to make a trip, I think, to Hutchison Community College. So hitting some JUCOs as well. They already named and, the school after Sidarius. It's amazing. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's. They, they would have gotten his name wrong. Oh, it's Hutch, wait, Hutchinson. Huh? Hutchinson. That's yeah. the name of the school? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not Hutcherson. I thought you said Hutcherson. Yeah. But um, that would have been impressive. Seriously. We, yeah. we, we love the, uh, and we love the, the name. That's a good one. Sidarius Hutchinson. Oh, yeah, that's a new get that a lot. Wait, no, yeah, it's Sedarius Hutcherson, but the school, the school you said Hutchinson. Is Hutchinson. Yeah, okay. Right. Sorry, I, Wes, interrupted you with a stupid. No, no, nah, okay. I was, I was, the, I was the interrupter with the stupidity there. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna stop talking. So, <laughs> it's a lot of going to see basketball games. Uh, obviously, all the like all star games, like all Ameri- you know, high school all American, all those things have happened. This happened a couple yeah. weeks ago, and coaches are there, aren't allowed to go to those, which is stupid. That is kind of weird. Are, are there any other football events, like any other camps, or just anything else? Uh, another glimpse, one final glimpse that these coaches are going to get at any of these prospects before the late signing period, or is it just watching basketball games? Yeah, yeah basketball games. You can watch a kid wrestle. You know, okay. you can do that. Does um, Carolina have any wrestlers in the twenty twenty pipeline? 2021, uh, Dylan Fairchild, who's an offensive lineman, is a very good wrestler, and so they they scouted him That's wrestling good. recently. Yeah. Um, so you can wrestling. do that. You can go, you know, you can check out film on guys or go talk to their coaches, the underclassmen. You can go do that right now, or you can, you know, again watch them go play basketball. Um, but really, that's it. You know, until you know staff will continue hitting the road until the dead period, and then uh, the spring practice at the end of February, and then. You know, you get into the spring evaluation period. There'll be spring practice at certain places that you can go watch. And, um, you know, then in the summer, in June, that's when you hit camp season. When's the next dead period? Don't have the date in front of me. Sometime in February. Okay. Well, it, it's or, almost always. Or no, right? it's, it's, it's not always. Sunday. It's the end of the Sunday right before February 5th. That's right. Yeah. 
the end of the Sunday before February 5th. So it's February Because February 5th second, is National Signing Day. So it's, it's fifth, always yeah. February like that final Sunday yep. before National Signing Day is the final day of the open and period. And it'll be a dead period time. until you mentioned you get to go they get to go to spring practices? Yeah, they'll have spring uh spring evaluation period. And then is it dead again until the summer or is it alive again just through the summer? It's live. Well, for the most part, there there is a dead period in the middle of the summer, I believe. There is. For the most part, it's what is that? A quiet period when there's different periods during the summer. Kids can visit you, but the coaches don't visit kids. Yeah. So basically. in March, you'll get like the beginning of March through mid April is quiet, which means kids can visit your campus. You can't go visit them, so it's not like a contact. So then after that is your evaluation period. So it's April. You know, it's always mid-April to, like, the end of May is your evaluation period. So kids can come visit you, hmm. but also the coaches can go on the road and evaluate guys. Now, they're not going every single day. That's just a whole period, and you get a certain amount of days, you, you know, like that you can go hit the road. Per kid, two I visits think. per kid, one a certain a, amount. One is called an athletic eval, and one's called an academic eval, but it's really – all sort the of same, yeah. mixed together, I think. It, and then in the de- there's one more dead period. The one Wes referenced is later June, like after camp season. Uh, it's June, late June to late July. There's like a one month dead period mixed in there too. Cool. All right. Well, so. good news for y'all. You do not have to remember that y'all. A lot of you probably already knew that. The rest of you were probably yeah, we, confused, I like I am. Remember. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm going to ask you guys probably every week for the remainder of the off season. Of hey, is it, is it a dead period? Is it a is it a live period? Is it a quiet period? Did y'all know they're making a second Quiet Place movie? I did. How do you feel about that? Did you see the first one? I really liked the first, first one. First one was awesome. Yeah. How do you I feel about know, the second? I don't know how they're going to go about this, but is it a I actual saw, sequel? Is it more of a prequel? Yeah, so it is a sequel. It, it was interesting. I, I saw a first trailer for it the other day, and I, I thought it was going to be a prequel because it opens in a flashback, but it's uh-huh. basically like they leave their home, and they're just like out looking for survivors... Um, I don't know exactly what to make of it. I'm generally out on sequels, especially something that, like, Quiet Place was just such a self-contained story. I didn't think it needed a sequel, so I'm, I'm skeptical of it, but um, I don't know. We'll see. But all that to say, we will remind you when it's a quiet period, when it's a dead period, when it's a live period, because I'm not going to keep track of that, so I'll have to keep asking Wes and Chris, or y'all can just check in on GameCockCentral.com and see what the latest is. Subscribe to GameCockCentral.com, rate and review and subscribe to this podcast, everything else on the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. I'll be back with Colin Taylor with another episode of the Hard Foul after South Carolina plays Auburn tonight and to look ahead with their weekend matchup against Vanderbilt. Wes and Chris and I will be back next Wednesday. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.